thought it was about time for a change of scene, so we've come to College Station, Texas, the Museum of the American GI, and we're going to go over their M24 light tank. By March 1943, the Army had decided that its light tanks needed to have a little bit more firepower than the 37mm found then on the M3 and M5. They decided to go with a 75. They also decided that they were quite happy with the powertrain of the M5 and wanted to keep it, although the tank had to be a little bit bigger and a little bit wider as well, not least to mount the larger cannon. What they ended up with was the M24 light tank known as the Chafee or Chaffee, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Adne is, of course, not around to tell us how he pronounced it, and I have met persons of the same spelling who have pronounced it both ways. M24 entered full-scale production April 1944. 4,731 units were built in two facilities. The description in the manual is simple enough. It states, and I quote, the light tank M24 is an armored, full-track laying combat vehicle mounting a 75mm gun. It consists of a crew of four men, the commander, a gunner, the driver, and an assistant driver. And no, I am not misquoting. The hull is fully welded, generally made of one-inch plates. Split into two compartments, crew compartment in the front, and an engine compartment in the back, which is separated by a stepped bulkhead. All sides, as you can see, are not vertical like in most tanks, they're angled inwards at 12 degrees. An inspection of the whole front reveals no massive surprises. There is a bow 30 cal on the right hand side. The front hull, of course, is dominated by the access panel for the differential. Final drives are located in the typical bulges on the inside of the sprocket wheels. Front left of the vehicle, simple enough. Service drive, blackout marker, siren. Manufactured, it says, by the Federal Electric Company of Chicago, Illinois. And for road marches, the driver has a windshield. Collapsible forward, of course. Locked down into position. And for road marches, can come up. You'll see it does have a windshield wiper and a heating filament uh, for defrosting purposes. One of the great mysteries of life that has been pointed out to me is that nobody seems to be entirely sure what these are for. They weren't, I'm told, on the original vehicles. Uh, later production vehicles had them added. And uh, there are also some at the back, so the idea of it maybe being a bulldozer mounting doesn't seem to be applicable. Who knows, maybe by the time we have this video edited, I'll find out the answer. As you move further back towards the rear of the vehicle, you've got tow cable, first aid box, a pull handle here. This is the external handle for the engine compartment fire extinguisher. It can also be set off from inside the tank. You'll see the sand shields have been removed. Uh, they tended not to last very long in combat anyway. They're a bit of a nuisance, so the museum has taken them off this particular vehicle. Uh, track blocks. The track blocks that you'll see at the back here are in a different position than you'll see on a lot of M24s out and about today. Uh, there was a post-war modification that the track links were moved to the front of the tank. One of the more significant differences between the M5 and the M24 in terms of the running gear is that the M5's bogey system has been replaced by an individually sprung torsion bar system. Five pairs of wheels per side. Now, the thing about torsion bars is uh, because you have to leave room for one bar to be in front of the other, the wheels are not actually even. If you look straight sideways under a torsion bar vehicle, you see that one set of wheels is further forward than the other. Shock absorbers will be found on the first, second, last and second from last road wheel arms. The center road wheel doesn't have a shock absorber. All the arms will, however, have a bump stop, and this prevents the arm from going up too far and snapping your torsion bar. Now, one of the downsides of a torsion bar system is that repairing it is not an easy task. If a torsion bar breaks, what you have to do is pull off one of the road wheels, disconnect the torsion bar anchor, pull out the part of the torsion bar that hasn't actually broken. Then what you have to do is reach inside and somewhere inside the tank are going to be the remnants of the other part of the torsion bar that snap. Fragments here, there. And, uh, if they're inside a guide tube, that makes it worse because if you can't unbolt the guide tube, uh, then you have great difficulty reaching the fragments that you have to pull out. It's, it's almost as if you wish you could turn the tank on its side and shake it and the pieces would fall out. You have to get every last fragment out before you can put the new torsion bar in. And it's enough of a hassle that when we had a, uh, an Abrams, uh, one of my wing tanks had a number seven left torsion bar snap. We just drove around with it in that condition for two weeks before we bothered to change the torsion bar. It was just too much hassle to change. Bogey system, unbolt the bogey, replace, put new bogey back in, easy done. Now one of the problems if you have a broken torsion bar and you drive around it for too long, however, is that the weight of the vehicle is now concentrated on fewer torsion bars. 
which means that the longer you wait, the more likely that you're standing in a motor pool and you hear this almighty clang as another torsion bar breaks. And again, it's a cumulative effect. You've got two torsion bars broken. It's gonna, you don't replace it pretty quickly. You're going to have three and then four and then five, and then you have just have a complete mess. So difficult to change, but when you get a chance, you do need to change torsion bars.